Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a beloved and iconic actress and singer whose seven-decade career spans every medium in the world of entertainment. After some early theater work in her native England, she made her Broadway debut in 1954 alongside Julie Andrews in The Boyfriend. She's also starred on Broadway in the original production of 42nd Street and Side by Side by Sondheim, for which she was nominated for the Tony Award for Best Featured Actress in a Musical. She received a second Best Actress Tony Award nomination for her starring role in the musical King of Hearts. In London's West End, she starred in Expresso Bongo, The Crooked Mile, and The Card. And over the years, she starred in a number of other shows in London, including the Sondheim musical Follies and Gigi. In movies, she's appeared in Nothing But the Best, Those Magnificent Men in Their Flying Machines, Stop the World, I Want to Get Off, Alfie, and The Last Word. And on television, she became a household name in the UK, first on the enormously popular BBC hit series, That Was the Week That Was, for which she won a BAFTA TV award in 1964, and then for three seasons as the star of her own TV series, Mainly Millicent, for which she won a TV Society award. On American television, you've seen her in dozens of shows, playing memorable characters like Harriet Conover in Downtown, Gladys Moon on Moon and Sun, Lily Faversham on Days of Our Lives, Gertrude Moon, Daphne's mother on Frasier, and most recently as the beloved Joan Margaret on Grace and Frankie, co-starring Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin. She's also had guest starring roles on The Drew Carey Show, Will and Grace, Modern Family, Hot in Cleveland, Two Broke Girls, and many others. I'm delighted to welcome the wonderful Millicent Martin to our show. Millie, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for such an introduction. I I didn't know I'd done so much work. It just crept up on me over the last 88 years. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you've had quite the amazing career and it was a lot of fun researching your career. Now, as you know, our show is televised in the UK, and I want you to know that when I told our producers in London that you were appearing on our show, they were overjoyed. So even though you've lived in the United States for quite a long time, and you only work occasionally in England, I hope you know that you are still immensely popular in the UK. Do you realize that? Well, I, I, my friends had said so because uh, Fraser is still playing there. But uh, it's nice to know that, that the young people are still watching me because I thought the only ones left would be people of my age because I left, I did leave in 1977 when I came over here with with the show uh, Side by Side by Sondheim and I met my husband on the opening night in Sardis at a party and three months later we were married. So... <laughs> Now, a lot of people may not know that when you were a child, your first love was dancing, not singing or acting, correct? Yes, I was a, I was a dancer. I studied a classical ballet, but I didn't grow tall enough. I was only five foot and they wanted people five foot six and over. So I went into modern ballet and I did that. I took my exams in classical ballet because my father said, well, you know what the show business is like. If you're out of work, you can always teach. He said there will always be a job for a, a ballet teacher. So I was glad I took the exams, but I never I never needed to use it. I, I was one of the lucky ones. You went to the Italia Conti Theatre School and you were in the same class with Anthony Newley. Was it evident even back then that he would become a big star? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It, he was it, he felt like a brother to me. And we were so proud when he got the Oliver Twist film. He played the Artful Dodger. And we I mean, the whole school was so proud of him, but he was brilliant because even in that age, I mean, she, he was what, 16, he would write the end of term concerts. He would write the music and the lyrics and we would all we'd all do the, his show. And that was going on when he was, what, 17, 18 years old. So we all knew that he was there was no, no, no ifs, mans or buts about it. He was going to be a star. 
Did the two of you maintain a friendship throughout his life? Sadly, no, because he was in America for most of, of his adult life, and I was in England. I would see him. I mean, if he came in, it would, it would be lovely because, and we kept in touch. But, but it it would I just, we just didn't we went separate ways with our careers, and we weren't around anywhere. And in those days, you didn't have the lovely email that you could just drop somebody like you had to write a letter and then it took 10 days to get there and you know and and so if you weren't close to people enough with the phone you know it it faded out but I I, I did see him in his last cabaret act and it was lovely because I didn't say I was coming I wanted to surprise him and I sat in the audience and he was doing the show and he was very and his eyes suddenly looked at me and he went Oh, my God, it's Millie. And it was lovely. It was lovely to surprise him. Oh, that's beautiful. Now, when you were doing That Was The Week That Was in England, you were the resident singer. Was it your ambition at that time to become a popular recording artist? It's 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 a, a thing I was just talking to my husband about a couple of days ago. It was a, It was a stupid mistake I made. I loved singing. I love doing my television shows, but I guess I was so busy doing the shows and rehearsing and, and doing guest shows and things that I to find time to go into a studio and sing and take three or four days or five days to do a really good LP, I, I guess I wasn't, I wasn't adult enough at that time I think I was a bit too young and I, I let that slip and it was stupid because George Martin was my producer for the for the records had I stayed with him goodness knows what would have happened but I didn't and it was my I, my wrote to him when he they did a big television show and they wanted me to say a few words and that and I wrote to him and said didn't I make a mistake you know a really big one well, you know, I believe in destiny, but I will tell you, Millie, you recorded a song after President Kennedy was assassinated called oh. In the Summer of His Years, which became a hit single in the UK. And in America, it was recorded by Connie Francis, I think. Yes. Was that frustrating for you that your version didn't get the chance to make it big over here? Because I loved your version. And, and no, I, I mean, it was fun. It did, it did get into... I think it got up into sort of like fortieth or thirtieth place, and but but you know Connie Francis is, was one of the loves of the American people, so obviously if she did the song, she, it was going to be a hit for her, and that was all right. That was okay. I done, I had sung it originally on the on the memorial to Kennedy, and that meant more to me than having a a single on it. Well, I just love that recording. Now, when you had your own TV show in the UK, you did a skit with Roger Moore where he played James Bond long before he actually got the part in the movies. That was some brilliant casting, don't you think? Well, he was he was down the road in another studio. We were very close together, and he was doing he was he was doing a sort of early English James Bond type. It was a big hit in England. And I, we asked him if he could come over and be his character. And we said, no, we they, he couldn't use the name in any other show. So we said, well, can we call him James Bond? And he said, they said, oh, yes, that's fine. So over he came and he was James Bond 30 years before he was James Bond. <laughs> That's just and he, amazing. He said, "I he said, I don't have a very good voice, but I I I would like to have a duet because we said if you'd like to sing a duet, he said I can play guitar. So so we said, okay, we'll work something out so that the singing is not a hundred percent. So we put him on a sofa, one of these sectional sofas that was almost the width of the studio. He he was on one end, and I was on the other, and as we sang." Pieces of the sectional would disappear, would come out. So we get close and we were singing side by side because that was the song he felt safe with. And right at the end, we said, and 
side by side when we were together. So it was lovely. And it, it took the, you know, the, the fear of it for him. What a special moment. I understand that when you did The Boyfriend on Broadway, you shared an apartment with Julie Andrews, and the two of you have remained very good friends ever since. Tell me about your friendship with Julie Andrews. Oh, I, I, I'd heard her, I'd seen her singing this miraculous soprano voice when she was a child. You know, and we kids watch kids, and we were in the theater school, so we were, we were keeping an eye on her, and she was in a musical, and Fiorin Martin, who did Guys and Dolls in London, their show, were there. And they asked her if she would like to come and do The Boyfriend on Broadway. And so she spoke to her mother and her mother said, yes, she could come. Uh, but he, she would only give one year. The rest of the company had to sing two years. But the only thing that, that they would they would give her a year on as she was much young. she was about I think three or four years younger than us, which meant she was only about 17, yeah. And so she came in and this beautiful voice, this lovely voice with absolutely no no strain at all. And another thing that I, a lot of people I think didn't know she's pitch perfect. I had to go and sing a, an audition and I hadn't got, got time for a pianist. I knew my song, but I haven't got time for a pianist. I wanted to tell him what key. And I said, I, I don't know what key I'm singing. She said, sing it to me. So I went, hello, that. And she went, that's a B flat. She absolutely pitch perfect, could tell you any any note that was there. And to this day, this lovely lady sends me on the June the 8th, the most beautiful bouquet of flowers every year. And it, say, oh, it always says, to my chum. She calls me chum. It's now, ev everyone I've ever spoken to who knows her says that she has a rather salty sense of humor and vocabulary. Is that true? Yes, indeed. <laughs> we shared an apartment and she was going off to see them about my fair lady and she was getting ready in the bedroom and I could hear her <clears throat> language, her salty language going on about her shoes and her bag and where's her socks and where's this, that and the other. And she came out through the door and all dressed up and I said, off you go, be good. She got to the door and she's going to the door going, oh, and she opened the door and she said, well, here goes Julie Andrews. And now she went and slammed the door. And she knew exactly what they wanted, uh, you know, from for uh, my fair lady. So she 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 was ready, but, but she wasn't going to bother with it until she got into the street. <laughs> Well, that's well, kind of cool that you got to know the real Julie Andrews, not the Julie Andrews we know. No, she's lovely. She introduced me to Italian food. I'd never had. She introduced me to Chinese food. I'd never had any of those. As a kid with very little means uh, in a tiny apartment with another girl who was in the same show, I mean, a treat for us was to go and have fish and chips once a week. And I said, I think I, I think I grew up on baked beans on toast, you know. So to be to be taken to restaurants in New York and, and everything, into lovely shops, and actually walk me around, it was a great time, great time. Now, Millie, you mentioned that you decided to move to America after meeting and marrying your husband, Mark. I want to tell you, I, I thought about that as I was doing my research. I think it was very courageous of you to move to America, given that you were already extremely popular in England. You could have continued to have great success in your career over there. I think you took quite a risk in moving to America at that time, don't you think? Yes. And I, and it wasn't as though I was in my 20s and just coming up. I, you know, I was 44 when I came over here. I met Mark, he, we, I was in Sardis on the opening night of, of the show, of Side by Side, uh, side by Side by Side time, uh, with my aunt who had flown over, to, who was really the lady who brought me up. Who, she'd flown over for, for a visit to see the opening night. And I heard this lovely voice say, would you excuse me, Miss Martin? He's got this wonderful brown voice. 
And I looked up and I thought, oh, and he's gorgeous. So I said, hello. And he explained that he was a vocal coach and that all the things that he did to, with his students, I was doing on the stage. He said it, it's, it was a complete match. He said, if you'd come to one of my lessons, you would see it was exactly what you were doing. He said, so I wanted to come over and say hello and tell you how marvelous I think you are. And then he said, you're going to get very tired these first few weeks because there's going to be press and everything. He said, so would you like to come out to my house over the weekend, one weekend, and rest up in Connecticut? And I looked at him, side on, and I said, yes, if I can bring my friend Julie McKenzie. And he said, oh, oh, yes, yes, of course, of course. So Julie and I came out there and spent the weekend. I knew the second time I saw him, I was going to marry him. And I had to really think about it because it was a risk. I had to, I was giving up something which basically at that time was pretty surefire for show business because of the, of the work I'd done. And But I thought ahead and I thought, what do I want to do when I'm 80? Do I want to be sitting here in a lovely apartment, but maybe all on my own, you know, and just sort of getting older and older and not have somebody I love uh, as company because I didn't know. And I I said, he's, he's, he's it. He's the one I want to spend the rest of my life with. And I was right. I made the perfect choice because we do nothing but laugh. I mean, it, it's been 46 years and it's just it's just a delight to be with him. I so, think that is such a gift that you followed your instincts. You did not let business be the priority. You decided to trust your destiny, follow your heart. And look, you've had a fabulous career since you came to well, America. But had I not, I still would be okay because it was a choice I made for my happiness. You have a certain happiness when you work and then you have a certain happiness at home. But when you get to 80 or 90, there's not going to be any work. Unless you're Millicent Martin. <laughs> One of the first things your husband told me is that my wife works too much. <laughs> I love it. I love doing it. I love work and I always will, but I'm again I'm I'm trying to make the right decision to to not do anything that is beyond me to only basically work with people I know with producers and directors and all the lovely people that I've met to stay sort of with them and not to venture out with strangers. I think it, that way I can still work and enjoy it. Well, one of the greatest shows you did on Broadway was Side by Side by Sondheim. And when I was doing my research for this interview, I read that initially Stephen Sondheim was not particularly enthusiastic about doing a show featuring a compilation of his work. Is that right? Did he tell you that? Well, uh, David Kernan called him and he said, oh, you can do it, but I can't think of anything more boring. <laughs> that was how he felt. About it. He felt that out of context, in the out of context of how all the music fits into the show. He felt they might be on their own, not. He said, what are you going to do? Just going to do, sing a list of that show, sing a list of that show. And we said, no, we're going to mix it all up. And what we did was we made it uh, things like youth, marriage, divorce, theatre, and we used those anger, happiness, so we use those to make the little vignettes. And we never did more than four songs at a time because if pe people didn't know Stephen Sondheim that well at that point, the audience hadn't yet cottoned on to him because they had to be educated to his music. You have to see some shows to really 
understand his brilliance. And so these little four vignette things would make it, one song could follow another and make that humorous because of the song that was there before. So we tried to do that so that these little sections, and Ned would explain between each section what Stephen was doing, how he was working, and and the fun we'd had with him. Because although the show was nothing to do with him apart from his permission, when we did it in London, he came over. We we had been at one theatre and we were transferring to another theatre, a better theatre, and he came over. And between those those days, he said, "Can I?" Can I sit and listen to you and talk and watch rehearsals and everything? He said, I know I don't have any rights, but can I, you know, we said, oh, please. of course you can. So he he stayed for three days and he did all the stuff, did all the thing, and he thoroughly enjoyed it. And he said, well, I've got one song, Mill, he said, that um, I wrote for a film and they only kept about eight bars of it. The rest of it was cut because of them. That's how the film ran. He said, it's called I Never Do Anything Twice. He said, would you do it? And I said, yes, I'd love to, because I'd never heard it. And I said, yes, I'd love to. Give it to me, we'll re rehearse it, and I'll put it in. I said, but on one, on one condition, when you announce it to anybody else, you say, would you like to sing Millicent's song? I said, because it's my song. Everybody else can sing it, but I got to sing it first. Well, I really think that you and the other cast members of Side by Side deserve a lot of credit for making the public more aware of Sondheim's music, because quite frankly, before that show, I think a lot of us had never heard of anything he'd done besides maybe Gypsy. So that show was really important for his career, don't you think? Yes, yes. And I think that's why... I think that's why he didn't say no to it, because although he would, you know, Stephen's very dry and would say, oh, I can't think any more boring. I think as, as clever as he was, he'd hooked on to the fact that maybe we had something that, that would be good. Because I had two friends, two wonderful theatre lover friends who secretly, you know, it's illegal, taped the show and sent him the tape. And when he got the tape, that's when he flew over because he realized there was something there because there was all the announcing and everything. And he realized what was going on. And I always wondered, I mean, that was in 77. Recording machines were this big. How did they get those machines into the theater hidden and turn them on? I mean, I, some of them you had to plug in. I mean, what were they doing? Crawling around in the dark looking for outlets? I don't know how they did it, but they, they managed to do it and sent it to us. What was your favorite Stephen Sondheim song to perform? That is really hard. I would say for sheer sheer talent, length, depth of the song, I never do anything twice. The intensity of that song. Yeah. For fun and anger, leave you, which was the other one that I did, uh, which I loved. And I, when I was doing it, I thought, I don't know sure how to get around this. And I, I said to Mark, because of him being a vocal coach, what do you, you know, this leave you, what do I, what do I do? Because it gets, it gets angrier and angrier. And he said, don't get angry. He said, why don't you just smile through the whole thing? Leave you. Leave you. How could I leave you? How could I go it alone? And then from then on, even when she gets angry, could I leave all the things on the Paris in Spain? Would it pass? It would pass. Could I bury my rage with a boy half your age in the grass? Pitch your ass. But I've done it already. And so the whole thing was done with this evil joy at, at my husband, you know, going. So, Mark Steve is brilliant. That was the exact interpretation 
to convey to the audience that boiling rage that was underneath that smile. It really was a brilliant piece of advice. It was. It was. It, it made the song for me, you know, and, and Stephen loved it because it was a different version. The thing I loved about Stephen was if you could come up with a different interpretation of those lyrics without spoiling what his work was, you're not trying to change word meanings or anything if you honor the words but then you find another way to give them life he was he was all for it he loved it now millie you played the role of lily faversham for three years on days of our lives every single actor i've had on our show has told me that working on a soap opera is the toughest work an actor could ever do do you agree with that because yes. you've been on broadway doing eight shows a week Piece of cake, by comparison. Really? Well, you're on. You're on three hours. You're in the studio, eight hours, ten hours, five days a week. You're getting. You're getting scripts the night before. With you, with pay. Uh, when I, when they, when they asked me to do it, it was an emergency, and they said. They called me at noon and said, can you be on the seven o'clock plane and you'll be in the studio tomorrow at eight? And I said, okay, well, at that time there was no computer. So I said, could you send me the, the what was it before the computer? What was that? Recording? You mean the fax machine? Yes. I said, he said, could you fax me the lyric at uh, the pages? I went out to have some a meal with my with Mark. We came back in, and there's forty pages on the floor for tomorrow. I got on the plane with these pages, and I said to the lovely stewardess, "No dinners, no dinner. Make me a sandwich and coffee." I said, "I can eat the sandwich and work on the script. I can't." So I did that, and I. I had another wonderful friend, B. Arthur. Oh. I had worked with her just after we fin I finished The Boyfriend. Before I went back home, I did a, a, a play with B, and I just fell in love with her, the most lovely lady. So I phoned B and I said, I've got to come out. I've got to learn all this script, and I've got to be there at 6 o'clock in the morning. I said, if I stay in a hotel, I'm not going to do it. I, it won't happen. I'll be too nervous. She said, oh, come over, come over. So I get in, get to Los Angeles, get my car, and I drive out to B, and she's waiting. And her, the bedroom for me is filled with these gorgeous roses that she grows it's with wonderful perfume, and they were all the way around for me. And I, I stayed with her until I found an apartment. I stayed with her for about 10 weeks. And when I finally said, oh, B, luckily I found an apartment now, she grabbed her chest. Oh, she's leaving. She's leaving. <laughs> I, would, I would have loved to see you work with B in the Golden Girls. I could have seen you as one of the Golden <laughs> Girls. Oh, I would have loved to have done that. That was wonderful. And and you you had B and you had Betty White, and Betty became one of my closest friends, one of my dearest friends. So I, when the COVID hit, she used to come, she used to be coming over every Monday to play Scrabble with Mark and I. This was our 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 set Monday for about oh three years I think it was, uh, and then you know, COVID happened and we all got isolated and very sad. Oh, but, for uh, sure. Uh, but working with those two ladies, they're wonderful. Now yeah. you co-starred with Eartha Kitt in Follies in London. What was she like to work with? I've heard all kinds of stories. She did. I, I'm still here, and I I did leave you. She I she got very very nervous. She always got very very nervous. And I walked up to her and I said, "I will say this to you, and please believe me, I'm saying it out of truth, not out of anything else. You sing, 
I'm still here, better than anybody. I said, now I sang it. It was my song and I sang it for all that time. I put you number one. Wow. I said, so, so please, please don't worry about anything. Just, we're all here. Just come on and have a good time. And she did, but there was always... She was always so nervous. It was uh, it was almost like panic attacks. It was and and it was very sad because what a talent. As you know, we recently lost Topol, with whom you co-starred in Gigi in London back in two thousand and eight. Do you have any memories of working with Topol that you can share with us, Millie? Well, Topol was he he was a delight. He. Funnily enough, I I was doing one of my television shows, more like a special, and he came on it. He was in London and they asked if he'd come on. So I had worked with him once. And so when it was nice to meet him again. It wasn't a cold meet. We, you know, we had talked before. And he was a delight to work with, but he was his memory was not as good as it had been and every now and then he would have a little glitch and he was always so apologetic and he was so lovely but it, it, I, I said to him it doesn't worry me darling when we're on stage doing this because we did the song a, a song together and I said it doesn't matter because I know the song all the way through I said just don't do it don't don't sing if there's a miss, and I'll I'll fill in, and that's that's what I did. And then we learned a little time after that he had indeed got one of these awful mind bending things. But he we had a good time. We had, we had a fun time. He was he was lovely to work with. He was he could be. He could be very naughty in in, in uh, being nice. One of our gentlemen uh, in rehearsals was one of those people that liked to upstage you, where you, for the, anybody in, who's not in show business, you stand uh, uh, upstage of the person. So when they turn to talk to you, the back of their head is to the audience, and he has or she has full control. And uh, this gentleman started to do this in rehearsal. And we we started one scene and this was going on. And suddenly Topol stopped from his chair. He turned around and he said, would you care to come and join us in our rehearsal? We'd love to have you with us <laughs> because he was way upstage. And, of course, if that, this guy was went bright red and moved out. But it was a lovely way to warn him, don't do that again. <laughs> I like that. I like that. And it's it's sad when you see that kind of egotistical behavior when you're dealing with such a professional like you, you must find it disconcerting. Well, I think sometimes, you know, other people say, no, not New Nelly. I think sometimes they don't know they're doing it. If they've not been trained, they just think they it's better up there for them for him at that time and i don't think i don't i, I sometimes i just don't think there's any animosity any or anything in it it's just a mistake and um, and no knowledge uh, of what one should do with the other people on the stage now of course i have to ask you about playing joan margaret on grace and frankie did you know jane fonda and lily tomlin before you started working on the show no, no. I was doing a film in England and uh, it tanked halfway through. The gentleman ran off with the money. And so oh, is that the movie called Melody? Melody, yes, that is the movie. And sadly, they had to close it down. They said, we hope we can get enough money and, and in time to open it up again. They said, but we'll fly you back home because you don't want to just sit in the hotel. And if, we, if and when we can get it up and running, we'll, we'll fly you back. So I flew back and I was very upset. I was going to work with Joan Collins, lovely Joan Collins. And I was going, I'd never worked with her and we chatted about it. And so I was really looking forward to the scenes coming up later in the 
in the film. I got my other stuff done, and then I never got to even see her. She hadn't even arrived, I don't think, into England But when it happened. So I flew back home, and I was really, really upset by it because it was a good film, and it was a lovely part, and I was thoroughly enjoying it. And 10 days later, my agent gives me a call and says, there's a guest shot on Grace and Frankie. And I said, oh, lovely. So went in, did the guest shot, had, had the best time of my life. And they waited and saw it put out in in its entirety, the whole thing. They watched it. And then they phoned me and said, will you come back in? We'd like you to be recurring. So if the film hadn't tanked, I would never have done Grace and Frankie. That's so, destiny yeah. for you. So what was it like to be the new girl on the set, joining the cast of a show that's been running for a few years? They were unbelievable. They really were so lovely. And I I don't think I'd met Lily before. I'd not met and not met Jay, but Lily came up and she was so lovely. She had seen, I think she, you know, she is a big theater goer herself, and she'd seen the stuff that I'd done and she'd said, Oh, it's lovely to see you. And she was so welcoming. I mean, she and Jane made it a joy for me, just going into the studio every day and seeing those two ladies. They were just so lovely. We were like a terrible trio. <laughs> oh, you created absolute magic on the show. You know, I, as I'm, as you're sitting here talking with me, I'm thinking to myself, you've been in show business for over 70 years, Millie. You've worked with so many people. You've experienced so many ups and downs. You just told us about the experience in England of making a movie called Melody. And then halfway through the shoot, some guy takes off with all the money. The movie never gets finished. How do you deal with that kind of unpredictability and instability in this business? Well, it it always hurts, but I think you, in a way, you get used to it because I've tried. You know, I've I've been lucky with the, with the musicals that I've done, but one or two that we tried failed. Uh, so that's the same feeling. You're you're all revved up to go and do this musical, and then they say they put up a little letter saying thank you very much. We're so sorry it's closing. So you you have grown up actually. I think getting in our in our business life is full of rejections. If you can't take the rejections and just take them as part of the deal, it's got nothing to do with whether your talent has just rolled out the bottom of your feet. No, it's just that it either your look or your behavior, or demeanor or voice doesn't do what they want for the scene or the scene doesn't work and it's cut or the show folds. So, it's uh, we get used to it. We we have hard shells actors. Well, you have a kind of a resilience that I don't think the public ever really understands. And until I started this interview show, you know, prior to that, I was a criminal court judge, which requires <laughs> a different kind of resilience. But you <laughs> have where do you think that resilience came from? That you can keep going and stay optimistic and not be angry and bitter. Where does that come from? I think that came from my aunt. My mother had TB and she died when I was 12. Um, I also had TB, but I was one of the lucky ones that the, the special pill that came in that cured TB came in after, just after my mother passed, sadly, but I got it. So... I was saved from from doing it. And so my aunt, even when I couldn't go to school, when I had the TB, I, was, I couldn't be near any children because it was catching. And she would bring me in books and she'd bring me in magazines and she, because there's no television, she'd bring me in a radio and she bought me records. We had a record player and we played records and, she loved all records. She loved opera. She loved jazz. She loved everything. And so do I. I, I, I don't have any favourites. I just love it all. 
and she, she would play that. And I was isolated for, I'm, I'm not sure, but it, I think it was about three years. Wow. And so at the beginning of my life, I was isolated. And when I got to this 88, I get isolated again. So <laughs> she, she was always enthusiastic. And if I had an audition, she was always there and, and positive. She never came with me, but she was always positive. She would always send me on my way. Go on, go and show them what you can do, you know. And it was that's how they, I, I, I think that's how I found not to be disappointed. If I came home, and said I didn't get it. She'd say, there'll be another. And that's the way I've always thought of it, that there'll be another. That's really a great lesson. Now, I know you're working on a memoir called Good Times and Bum Times. How is it coming along? It's coming along well. They always take a while. And, you know, once it gets to the point of uh, publishers and things, you just... You just sit <laughs> because there's the the wonderful Harry Potter. Apparently, uh, she sent it, she had to send it to twelve publishers before one took it. So that shows you how difficult it is. But we've got we've we we are we haven't finished it all, but we've got all the story stuff together. It's just got to be shaped into the right shape for the for the audience now not the right shape for me not the right shape for any friends the right shape for the people who are going to read it who don't know me from the beans and they are going to read it and they've got to find out who i am so that's that's the the, the thing we're on now hopefully it will be finished soon oh <laughs> millie but you know the show biz <laughs> Millie, will you promise me that when the book comes out, you'll come back on our show to promote it? I would love that. Oh, I would love to. I would love to. And Good Times and Bum Times comes from one of my songs. Of course, I'm still here. Well, I was going to do I'm Still Here and Stritch stole it. Bless her heart. Yes, bless her heart. <laughs> well, <laughs> I want to take you back to when you were a young girl at the Italia Conti Theatre School. Looking back, Millie, have you had the career that you envisioned for yourself all those years ago? Oh, way past. Beyond? Way, way beyond, yes. I thought I wanted to do musicals. I knew I wanted to do musicals, and I knew I'd be good at musicals because I'm I will I'll bang my own drum a bit. I was a triple threat. Yep. I sang, I danced, and I acted. And I like to think that I was almost as good in each one. You're I a think... quadruple threat because you're also beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Don't forget that. You're easy on the eyes, Miss Millicent Martin. <laughs> Thank you. But I I really felt, felt that there, there wasn't... There wasn't a weak one as opposed to the others. I was level and I'd been taught so well at the school. And I and I just thought musicals, musicals, musicals. And it wasn't until television came in and Ned Sharon asked me to go on the uh, a, a news show he had. That I, I think it was called Six O'Clock or something. And what they did was they did parodies of songs. And you had to learn it quickly because you've got like four hours. You come in, they give you the script, and four hours later, you had to sing it. And so David Kernan also came in. That's how I met David Kernan, was he would be in doing them. And from that, Ned liked what he saw, and he said, I'm going to put you in. We've got a new television show called That Was The Week That Was. He said, I want you to come in and join the cast. So that was wonderful. Up until then, I, I'd been doing all the musicals. I was well known to the musical public. I mean, they knew who I was, but not the rest of the country. And putting me in That Was The Week That Was, Ned virtually gave me my career. Oh, well, it was certainly a big, big 
visibility, that's for sure. Now, in our remaining moments, I just want to mention that our very dear mutual friend, Robert Wagner, our beloved <laughs> RJ, recently uh, had a wonderful visit with you and your dear husband, Mark. And Mark sent me a great photo of all of you. And I just hope you had a fabulous time together. We did. We hadn't seen them in like two years because they were up in Aspen. And we just, I thought, oh, my goodness, I wish we could see them. And finally, finally, they came down. They got on a plane and came down and came running into the house. And, and we had a wonderful, wonderful, we, we had dinner together. And it was just a joy to see them. Jill and he, had been, they have been, I had to have, I won't go into long thing, I had to have a, a big operation about five years back, as all people do. In that. And he could not have been more caring. He followed everything and make, made sure that I was going with the right surgeon, make sure this was right, make sure. He was absolutely wonderful. He would phone me and say, I've got this person, everything is fine. And he said, I suggest you go with a hypnotherapist, a friend of mine. And she took away all the fear that I was having about, because of thought of operations. And she gave me positive things to think about again to cover your fear with positivity and I went in and I breezed through it I I I, I wasn't scared I was nervous but I wasn't terrified that lady went she's a wonderful wonderful lady and uh, it it helped me enormously and RJ was the one who set it up well, RJ is a fountain of positivity. He's been enormously kind to me and to my show. And he phoned me yesterday and asked me to give you his love, he and Jill. And I know he'll be watching this show. So RJ, Millie and I are sending you our love. We love you. Thank you. And RJ, I love you back. You're my, you're my darling. You don't mind that, do you, Jill? <laughs> she doesn't mind. And of course, I have to mention another mutual friend of ours, Luke Yankee, who's one of my favorite people in the whole world. He was kind enough to facilitate this interview. So thank you so much, Luke. Yes, thank you, Luke. His wonderful mother, Eileen Heckett Hecky, was, was dear friends of ours for many years. And so we've known Luke for a long, long time on, on two different versions, one in the theater and television life and one in the home life with his wonderful mother yeah yes luke has inherited the best of both of his parents that's for sure luke well, has written a book on and a play on his mother which is going to be an enormous hit we've seen it it is fabulous yes i went to new york to see it it's called marilyn mom and me there was a reading in october it is spectacular and Luke yes. has a very bright future ahead of him. Oh, it's well, wonderful. Millie, I have only one more question for you, and it's very important. Are you ready? Yes. There is a rumor flying around Buckingham Palace that a handful of earth is missing from the Royal Garden. <laughs> Would you happen to know anything about that? <laughs> Carol Cook, the beloved Carol Cook, when I did 42nd Street, she said, had told me that she absolutely, she was such a royalist. She loved everything about it. And the queen, she absolutely adored. And I was visiting London and I thought, mm -hmm. what can I do? And I thought, I know, I'm, in, I'm on Pall Mall. Pall Mall is this huge road that leads down to the palace. So I thought, I've got to, little paperback. I'm going to get some earth from the garden here and I'll put it in and I can take some British earth back for Carol because she's so, so I'm putting this earth in and I hear a voice say, Miss Martin, what are you doing? And I look up and it's one of the groundsmen in his uniform. And I, I explained about Carol and how much she was a royalist and I was just wanted to get, he said, could you wait here 10 minutes? And I said, yes, 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 certainly. So I waited and he came back with a little box and he said, this is earth from the private rose garden of the queen. Uh, nobody is allowed in there. She looks after all the, the land, the garden, 
all the plants. That is her private gun, and that's from there. And I brought that back, and I gave it to Carol. I thought she was going to faint, that she had Earth from Buckingham Palace. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to tell you that Camilla would like it back. <laughs> well, she can whistle. <laughs> Well, Miss Millicent Martin, I must tell you, it's been such a pleasure to meet you and to have this chance to chat with you about your amazing life and career. I can't wait for that book to come out and for you to come back on our show. Thank you for all the wonderful performances. Thank you for taking the time to appear on our show. Oh, it was my pleasure. It was my pleasure. Our guest has been the incomparable Millicent Martin. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my PR director, Laurie Towers, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. And thank you for being so wonderful to talk to. Thank you, Millie. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.